day sharing, I would like to focus on the first phrase of this year's theme, through a different lens. And what I'd like to do, and I hope that you will bear with me, and I hope that it won't be too, uh, you know, booky, <laughs> uh, but I would like to give a little bit of background, a little bit of foundation for the rest of our presentations of the year. And so that's kind of how I'll be focusing. Excuse me. Um, I, we'd like to look today at that different lens through which women interpret life. Now, to a great extent this year, although not exclusively, we will be exploring the lens of women in scripture. And we'll try to read parts of the Bible together, but we'll try to do it in a very specific way, with the mind, the eyes, and the heart of women. The mind, the eyes, and the hearts of women. Today, and frequently throughout the year, I'll be relying heavily upon the work of contemporary women theologians and women biblical scholars. And the one that, that we'll use a lot today is Sister Barbara Reed, who is a Dominican scripture scholar, a professor of biblical studies at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. Professor Reed points out how differently from men women in ancient biblical times experienced life, and how different their lens was. Of course, it came out of their personal experience. Because at that time, women were generally illiterate. Their stories, none of their stories were written down. Okay. So think about that. Rather, they were all communicated through the oral tradition. And thus, very, very little of what women reflected about their lives has been preserved. We simply don't have it. I mean, there's some references in scripture, but we don't have the work of women preserved. Also, in a book entitled, Women's Work, the first 20,000 years. <laughs> Elizabeth Barbara. That's, that's, as my nephew would say, that's a few, that's a few whiles. <laughs> uh, in that book, whose author is Elizabeth Barber, she points out that for millennia, because the things that men made tended to be very large and very heavy and very permanent in nature, and thus survived. The things that women made, such as textiles, clothing, foodstuffs, woven fabric, and so on, though these things were truly essential for the survival of humankind, these things did not last. And so they were never noted as important. And not only has women's experience been lost, but we know and have to admit that often the Bible itself has been used as proof texts to oppress women. The suffragette Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who lived from 1815 to 1902, a little wise back, noticed efforts on the part of some to cite biblical texts as a rationale to halt the advancement of women mm -hmm. and keep them subordinate to men. And so good old Elizabeth dealt with this by deciding with a group of 26 other women to write her own version of the Bible. <laughs> and so today we do have recorded a women's Bible by Elizabeth Katie Stanton and her associates. And Wikipedia says of that book, that she wrote this work to challenge the traditional position of religious orthodoxy. The traditional position of religious orthodoxy that women should be subservient to men. Now, in addition to these resources, I'm sure that many of you remember the wonderful words of Sojourner Truth, yeah. whose, whose house is right here in our very own town. Uh, you perhaps recall the tale of her becoming aware one day 
of some mutterings of resistance in the congregation to what she was saying while she was preaching. She was a preacher. And um, she has said, a lot of the folks in the congregation happen to be clergy, but she is said to have stopped cold and all of a sudden looked at the congregation and asked, who your Jesus, honey? <laughs> Where he come from? He come from God and a woman. Men didn't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> now, with the women's movement of the 20th century, a lot of progress has been made. And women now play significant roles in our society. And among the finest biblical scholars and researchers today, many are women. But if we review the statistics, we see that there's still a lot of work to be done. Today, women are still one-third of the workforce, but they produce two-thirds of the work. Women own only 1% of the world's property. Uh, of the millions of illiterate people in the world, two-thirds are women. And two out of every three women in the world live in poverty. So there is still lots of work to be done. And if we are honest, we have to admit that there are passages in the Bible, as I suggested a minute ago, that support practices of injustice and violence toward women. Take, for example, the story in Judges 11, if you have time, you might want to take a peek at that, in which Jephthah promises, he's a warrior, that if God would give him victory over the Ammonites and see him safely home, he would offer as a sacrifice, a human sacrifice of gratitude to God, the first person who emerged from his house at his homecoming. That person happened to be his daughter. And after giving her some time to mourn with her friends, she was sacrificed. So how horrible is that? Or consider what's known as a text of terror that we also find in the book of Judges. When a man, uh, when, a, when a group of men who were assaulters um, appeared at a man's house and wanted him to release his male guest to them to abuse him. And he said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that, uh, but I will give you my concubine. So he released a woman to the group who, of course, abused and dismembered her. Well, these things are all in the Bible. Okay. And even the story of Hagar and Sarah, you know, it, it isn't a particularly loving text, uh, even though God shows care for Hagar and Ishmael. But it's, you know, Sarah is told she can do whatever she wants uh, to Hagar, and indeed she does. So, to understand the Bible, we need to be aware of inequities of class, age, culture, race, but most especially of gender. Now we read these texts at this time in history, certainly not to hold them up as part of Revelation, but we read them in order to expose them and to situate them in a sinful, misogynistic culture and never, ever, ever confuse them with the mind and the heart and the action of God. The enduring principle, and we used to say this last year, I remember, but the enduring principle in all biblical interpretation is that God wants fullness of life, happiness, peace, and wholeness for all humankind, both women and men. And any passage that seems to call into question that one foundational truth needs to be subordinated to that truth. Karl Rahner, a Jesuit for all the world, a 20th century theologian of immense stature, is wonderful. He, he of course, he wrote everything in German. and. Um, Whoever translated his work, I'm not just sure, but 
you sometimes wonder if you read a sentence or two, what was the antecedent? I mean, it sort of garbled, but nevertheless, his theology is marvelous. And when he talks about God's creating human persons, he talks about each one of us as an event. A person is an event put into movement by God. This is what he says. A human being is an event of a free, unmerited, forgiving, and absolute self-communication of God. So every one of us, there's no gender preference, every one of us, we each of us, is an expression of God's redeeming and loving and merciful word. So each of us is a word of God. Centuries ago, St. Paul said essentially the same thing in what is considered the core statement of Paul uh, determining God's vision for humankind in Galatians 3. We're all familiar with it, but let me read it for you again. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves in Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, there are some other very controversial passages in Paul that all of us know about. We'll get to those a little later. But I'd like to suggest that both Paul's statement in Galatians and Rahner's definition of a human person are feminist statements. Okay? According to Elizabeth Johnson, feminism is not about goddess worship, it's not about bra burning. It's not about matriarchy. It's not about demonizing males. What feminism is, is simply a belief that holds that all of women's issues and challenges should be dealt with with the same degree of seriousness, attention, and concern that the culture gives to the issues and challenges of men. That's all. Okay? So, I believe that we can say very, very honestly that both of these are feminist statements. Now, I'd like to uh, bring our material today to a close by going over some kind of principles for you that you might like to use if you can come uh, with some regularity if you can't, that's fine, but whenever you can, come. Um, but there are seven guiding principles here from, from Elizabeth Schuschler Fiorenza, who is an author of one of the classics of feminist literature, and it's called In Memory of Her. And she gives us seven principles for reading the Bible with the mind and the heart and the eyes of a woman. We might like to keep these in mind as we move through our sessions together, okay? So the first principle she gives us is to watch for inequities and oppression of any kind when we're looking at the scriptures. Uh, and, but particularly to notice women's experience of gender discrimination. Uh, of course, there's no such thing as an absolute universal experience of women because everybody is conditioned in some way by our background and our education and our resources and so on. But, but some experiences have more to do with being a woman than they have to do with any other category. What happens is ha happens because we're women. I don't know whether you've ever noticed it, but one of my friends, I, did, I did not notice this myself, but one of my friends said to me when we went to a restaurant, we were given a place right by the, uh, by the restrooms and by the place where all the dishes are stacked and what is the name for that, but anyway. And my friend said to the lady that was giving us a place, she said, would you mind if we had the table over there? 
And then the person said, oh, no, not at all. That's fine. And my friend said to me, whenever women come into a public place, frequently they will be shown to the least desirable place unless they indicate that they would prefer another place. And I thought, huh, you know what, I think that might be true. Not universally, but to some extent. So anyway, to be sensitive to that sort of thing. Also, it's important to say that one doesn't necessarily have to be a woman to develop sensitivity to this issue. I suspect we all know some men who are very, very conscious of gender bias and who do everything they can not to feed into it. So that's an important thing to say. So that's the first thing. Watch for these inequities. Secondly, look at ourselves. Identify our own social location, which to a great extent will determine our lens. Think, for example, of how differently we might view the parable of the workers in the vineyard according to our social status. Remember, the owner kept coming back time after time after time, hiring more workers each time as the day wore on. Okay? You recall how at the end of the day, he paid all the workers the same wage. Now, think about it. Would not a wealthy, white, well-educated person tend to in interpret this story as a fairly grave miscarriage of justice. I've even heard people say, boy, if that were me, I'd be really ticked if I started working early in the day. But think about what a poor and illiterate and unemployed, uneducated person would feel when he or she heard this. Might not that person think how wonderful it would be to be treated this generously. So there would be a difference in perception according to our background. Okay, that's the second principle. Know ourselves and how our own, uh, how our own situation governs our lens. The third thing, use the historical critical method of interpretation. All that that means simply is ask questions about the text. Okay, who wrote it? For whom did they write it? And what purpose did they have in mind? You're all aware I know that each one of the four Gospels was written for a different community of believers, and their needs were taken into account by each one of the evangelists. We see lots of indication that their particular needs were dealt with in the story of the Gospel. Now again, I hope you don't get sick of hearing this, but we do need to acknowledge that basically, the Bible was written by men, for men, and to serve men's interest. And for millennia, white Western men provided the content of our biblical studies and interpretation. Now, it's really important to emphasize that that does not mean that we don't still regard the Bible as a privileged locus of divine revelation, because we certainly, certainly, certainly do. Okay. But what it does mean is that the instruments of God are fallible human beings, and they are sometimes victims of bias. So when we see evidence of this, again, we know it's to be attributed to human fallibility and a lack of understanding and never never attributed to God, who ever and always seeks to lift up the oppressed and never diminishes the dignity of anyone. Okay. Fourth, evaluate what the text does for those who accept it. Now here's where we run into a problem with Paul uh, in, a, in a text like Colossians 3, again, if you, 3, 18, if you have time, you might look at that. But that's the place, remember, that tells wives to be submissive to their husbands. And there are places in Paul where he says women should be quiet in church. And there are a lot of uh, kinds of directives given to women. Now, in decades past, 
I suspect all of you are aware, even though you're a lot younger than I am probably, mm -hmm. uh, but I suspect that all of you are aware that sometimes battered women were advised to try to return to their battering husbands for the sake of the sacredness of the marriage bond. And I guess what we want to do is ask ourselves, does this passage about women being submissive justify behavior of that kind? And of course, the answer is no. It doesn't. First of all, we need to know that this passage was, this whole epistle was probably not written by Paul himself, but by a disciple of Paul. There is a Pauline corpus that we are positive Paul himself wrote. And then there are some of the pastoral epistles and some of those that were relatively certain he never wrote, but people that had bought into his theology and were associates of him. So first of all, we don't think he wrote it. But secondly, we believe that this advice was simply common cultural practice and that it, it got into the text that way, not because this was a divine directive, uh, that it was not prescriptive, rather it was descriptive of, of the reality. Okay, that's four. Number five, it's good advice to unleash our creative imagination in reading the Bible, envisioning the world in the reign of God, and seeing it uh, at the foundation of it all, God's dream of a world of justice and peace. Um, if you are familiar with Ignatian spirituality and with the direct, with the exercises, you will know that St. Ignatius encourages people to do what he calls an application of the senses, where he encourages folks to enter into the scenes of the scripture and imagine what it was like, and imagine what it would be like for us, uh, or even imagine that we are playing one of the roles in the stories. Creative imagination is such a wonderful gift of God, and it makes life so much richer for us. And Elizabeth Fiorenza encourages us to do this. Um, so what this, this business of the reign of God that desires justice and peace and equality and dignity to be enjoyed by absolutely everybody, and not only every human person, but the world itself, all of creation, you know, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the ether, <laughs> if you will, um, all, all, all deserves reverence because it is the creation of God. And expressing this creatively and opening ourselves to it, even in drama and art and dance and theater and ritual, glorifying God in every way imaginable is a wonderful thing to do. Remember last year, we often, for example, during December when we were uh, looking at our Blessed Mother, we looked at the art. We had a whole long PowerPoint of paintings of the Madonna and Child. And, this, and even in our contemporary world, you think of something like God's spell, or you think of something like Joseph and the many colored coat. I mean, these are charming things that draw upon our creative imagination. And we're encouraged to, uh, to get into that as much as we can. Then this is a really important one. It needs some asterisks. It says, remember to reconstruct the narrative. Retrieve the past. Though not mentioned often, women have always been central to the mission of Jesus as disciples, as friends, and as benefactors. Look, Elizabeth Fiorenza says, look for traces of women's voices that have been submerged. In the Pauline corpus, there are specific references to women. For example, in Romans, we read about Phoebe, who was a deacon. We read about Junia, whom Paul calls an apostle. Elsewhere, we hear about Prisca, who is a teacher of one of the primitive Christian communities. And then, of course, in the Gospels, we certainly learn about Mary Magdalene, great preacher to the preachers who announced the resurrection, and Philip's daughters who were prophets 
and, and others. Now, I think it's very, um, it's not only likely, but it's almost certain that if these women were designated for significant roles of some kind in the early church, we can be almost certain that there were many, many others. These happened to be the ones that found their way into the texts, but surely they were not the only ones. So as we do this, we can claim our own roles in the mission of Jesus. We are there. We are promoters of the mission of Jesus. We, women of the heart. And finally, we can look for opportunities to engage in action for transformation on the, for, for women, on behalf of women, so that God's word might never be allowed to be distorted as a weapon of oppression, but that God's word might always, always, always reveal the truth that sets all of us free. Okay? So those are the seven principles. And we will call upon them from time to time as we move through our reflection on various women in scripture and in history, women of faith, who through their lens have given us so much richness. Okay? <clears throat> now,